All right. How many of you need a handout? Okay, you already got your hand up. Okay. If you need one, hold your hand up. The ushers will rush to your side with one of those. Well, they'll get to your side with one of those. I don't see them rushing. No one's running, but they're getting there as quick as they can. Okay, if you are there, we're just going to look at one verse, one verse today. And that's 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, which says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That bears repetition. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, thank you so much again for always being there for us. Help us, Lord, to sense your presence even more than we perhaps already do. And if we don't, Father, pray you help us to just lay everything aside, every thought, every concern, as best we know how right now, Father, pray you help us to put everything else, all other distractions aside, and just focus on what you have for us today and help us, Lord, to be sensitive to your presence, the Holy Spirit living in each of, each of us, who will illuminate your word to us today. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would teach us. May the words that come out of my mouth be pleasing to you. May they lift you up and be in accordance with your word. Not my own thoughts, not my own feelings, not my own philosophy, but yours. And as you are lifted up, may each of us lost and saved alike, be drawn to you. And if there's anybody in this room, Father, who does not know you as Savior and Lord, help them, Lord, to humble themselves today. And may you draw them to you today. And may they respond in a way that's best for them and glorifying for you. For we all ask all this in Jesus' name, for his sake, and with thanksgiving. Amen. All right. We are in a series uh, called Emotions in God and Man. This is the fifth week of that series, and I'm talking about a, uh, an emotion today that's probably a little bit different than, one of the, than some of the other ones that I've, I've spoken about. I've spoken about things like love and jealousy and, and uh, stress and anxiousness and things like that. But uh, I want to talk today about fear, as you see there at the, the, the top of your heading. And the reason I chose this as the last one, because this puts us in the middle of October, and October is the month when Halloween is coming up. The last uh, day of this month is Halloween. And by the way, the word Halloween is a shortened version of what, what used to be called uh, All Hallows' Eve, because November 1st is considered All Saints' Day. So the day before November 1st is considered All Hallows' Eve. And that was shortened into the word Halloween and is actually not the saint's day, but it's actually the devil's holiday. And you may not realize this, but in many places around the country, it is the most celebrated holiday. It's far from, any, from a holiday. The word holiday, of course, comes from holy day. It is far uh, away from being a holy day, but it is a, a satanic holiday. And it is, it is the, one of the, the second uh, most important day on the satanic calendar. Did you know that? By the way, did you know what number one is? The biggest satanic holiday of the year? Anybody know? It's not Halloween. It's actually your birthday. Your birthday, because you are number one. Your birthday is all about you, and Satan wants you to focus on you. This is not my words. This is the satanic church. And I'm not encouraging you to look it up. That can, that can open up doors for you that are not healthy for you, spiritually speaking. Um, but um, it is true. The birth, your, your birthday is the most important day on the satanic calendar. Second is Halloween. Halloween. Right down the street. Have you noticed this? 
a walking distance from our church on the corner of Cleveland Avenue and um, 161 in the shopping center there, there is a, a very large haunted house in the shopping center. This is not a commercial. I'm not advertising for them. It's actually a, kind of a warning, uh, kind of a heads up. Uh, it is called Fear Columbus. Fear Columbus. And it's a big deal. They've got a huge section of the parking lot um, fenced off with the uh, kind of walls around it. The, the fences have, have uh, I don't know, there, there's something blocking it so you can't see into the area. But, but if you were to go up and look between the, the areas there, they've got, um, um, I don't know what I'm calling them. They've got railings set up uh, up and down through that, that parking lot there. So it looks like when you go to Cedar Point, or Disney World, where you get in this queue and you have to go up back and forth along this long line. You know, the line goes back and forth among the along the fences. It's it's a huge area set up for all the people that they that expect to go through there, <coughs> and they're already drawing big crowds. They have uh, fog machines. They've got lights. They've got scary sounds and stuff. And then you go in this this um, haunted house, and I have no idea what it costs to get in there. I don't really care, so I'm not going to go, but people pay money to get themselves scared. It's kind of weird when you think about it. They pay to be scared. Now, we're going to talk about fear today and where it comes from and where it belongs and where it doesn't belong. But I'm going to begin with number one, point number one. And you can see this is not a long outline. I don't expect to be here very long. We'll be done well before dinner. But fear is a human emotion. Fear is a human emotion. It's very human. And there's different things that we are afraid of. Look, go to your next blank. I think there's another blank there. We fear what we do not know. We fear the unknown. Many people are afraid of the unknown. And this is one of the reasons why uh, some people take the risks that they do um, to get a thrill because of the fear of the unknown. Uh, I'm thinking about free diving, I'm thinking about cave diving, I'm talking about well, some people like the thrill of skydiving. Um, there's, there's, it's, it's an unknown thing. It's a thrill. You're getting real close to death, and that puts a thrill into some people. It, it, to, to be that close to death, and, and that's, that's, again, paying for a form of fear. But fear is, is something that happens when we, when we don't know what's going to happen. And God told his people that there are so many verses about fear. If you were to, to Google the word fear or put it in your, your concordance and, and, and look up the word fear in the Bible, you'll get many, many, many references. Far too many for me to talk about in a service like this. Or we'd be here before supper. Okay? But I just picked out a select few that I think are representative of the rest. And in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, we have one of probably the most well-known. Many of you have memorized this verse, but the Lord says to Isaiah, to his people, through Isaiah, I should say, he says, fear thou not. That's, that's, an, uh, that's a, a strong commandment. Don't fear, he says. Why? For I am with thee. Be not dismayed. Why? For I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Or some versions say my righteous right hand. God tells them not to fear. Don't even be dismayed. And then he tells them why. He doesn't just say, just take my word for it. He says, because I am with you. <coughs> we just prayed this a couple of times this morning. Thank you, Lord, for always being there for us. Do you believe that he is? No, do you really believe that he is? Okay, I believe that if we really believe that he is, we would be far less afraid than we already are. We wouldn't fear the future. We wouldn't fear the unknown. If we really believe that God is with us. 
and doesn't allow us to go through anything by ourselves. He tells them this several times. He says, I'm with you. I will help you. I will uphold you. I will strengthen you. But what are some of the things that people are afraid of? All kinds of things, right? The list is almost endless. Sometimes we just fear risk. A man named Henry Fairley, I don't know the man. I, I mean, I don't know that much of him except for this one article that he wrote years ago uh, when he was serving on the Washington Post. He was, but he was writing this uh, in a syndicated column in the Tulsa World. He stated that the fear of risk, I'm quoting him now, the fear of risk is killing the American spirit. The fear of risk is killing the American spirit. By American spirit, he's talking about that adventurousness, that courageousness, that, that, fear, that fearlessness to go out into the wild, into the unknown, and, and establish new homes, new communities, new farms, new, new states, uh, and establish this country out of what was at the time pretty much a wilderness. And he points at the time to our overreaction to Three Mile Island. You may not remember that. This was a, a nuclear reactor plant on an island in the Susquehanna River, uh, south, just south of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And there was a, it, it, kind of a meltdown in one of the reactors and a small radiation leak. It wasn't nearly as bad as Chernobyl in Ukraine, but uh, it was kind of on that level. And a lot of people panicked all over the country, and it drove all kinds of people insane over nuclear power. But there was a great re overreaction to that. Uh, also, there were problems with the DC-10. Does everybody remember the DC-10 aircraft years ago? Uh, one of the engines failed on those, and everybody was afraid to fly. Uh, they were afraid to fly, especially DC-10s, and I can understand some of that. I have, well, let me say I don't have a love of flying. <laughs> so I can understand that and that reaction, but sometimes we overreact to the risks that we have living in the modern world. I know I'm going to show my age here, but I grew up in a time when cars did not have seat belts in them. Okay? We kids would, would ride around the country on the freeway over 40 miles an hour. And we would lay up in the back of the back window. Did you ever do that? Yeah, I, was, I, I liked that too. And you could do that because there were no headrests in the back seat. So it was just wide open there and just lay back there. And you could look at the clouds. As, as you, yeah, you remember those days, okay, yeah. <coughs> and the bench seats in the front, there was no bucket seats. You could sit three or four people across in the front seat. Um, and no, no seat belts, no airbags, nothing like that. Um, we, had, we lived in houses, this is gonna shock you. We lived in houses where we actually painted the woodwork with lead-based paint. Don't tell anybody. You know, another thing I used to do, I don't know if you, any of you used to do this, but I used to take thermometers. I like to take thermometers and break the thermometer and pour out the mercury and play with the mercury. Do you ever do that? No, you, you can't fish anywhere because there's lead or mercury poisoning in the, in, the, in the fish, you know? But now everybody's terrified of mercury. Uh, in school, public school, we, we would go to school, and they, they had water pipes, hot water pipes that would come up and down in the hallways. And these water pipes had insulation around them that was crunchy. Does anybody remember those? And we used to like to get in the hallway, and if we're standing there talking, you know, we, we would crunch the insulation. We just loved to hear it crunch and crunch and crunch. And these little white fibers would come out, you know, we'd play with those and stuff. You know what that was? Yes, asbestos. If you don't believe in miracles, just look at me. I'm alive! Okay? We survived it, right? But nowadays, everybody's terrified of this risk and that risk and the other risk. And, and, and we, we don't want our kids to play outside and eat mud pies like we used to. <coughs> or play in the dirt at all. But you know what? <laughs> Life is risky. I mean, I'm not downplaying the fact that, that, that uh, we should um, make life safer. But we still have to live life. We shouldn't be afraid of everything. I'm okay with seatbelts in cars. I don't like to use them. I mean, it's okay that they're there. 
I don't like to use them. The only reason I do is because my car annoys me to death. If I don't put my seatbelt on, it beeps and beeps and beeps and beeps. And uh, my previous car would beep a little bit and then it would stop. So most of the time I didn't put my seatbelt on. This new one that I've got, I have to put it on because it keeps on beeping and beeping. You know how long it'll beep if I don't put it on? 149 times. I'm serious. 140, it's, it, but, and so it wears me down. I think there's only been twice that I haven't put my seatbelt on. I waited all the way through till it stopped beeping. But, uh, but it, it annoys me and I put my seatbelt on. And it's probably okay. It's probably okay. But what I'm saying is that we want to eliminate all risks anymore. And this guy, I think, is, is right when he says <laughs> that the fear of risk is killing the American spirit. <clears throat> and then he applies it to the church. He says that many people are afraid to get involved in church because of the risk involved. Many people won't witness to somebody and try to become a soul winner because of the risk of being rejected or hurt if somebody says no or doesn't accept the gospel when you talk to them. Many people are afraid to give much money to God because they're afraid of not having enough for themselves. People refuse to become involved in evangelism because they feel like they might not succeed when they go to a mission field. That, they, that it won't work. Many people won't defend truth for the same reason. They're fear, fearful of rejections, that they, they might lose their friends, might be ostracized because they are standing for the truth of God. There's all kinds of things we're afraid of. I heard about this man who was sitting in the coach section of a plane and he got on, and, and when, he, when he got on, he sat down, he, he was just shaking, just shaking, and just like this, and, and just, just real stressed. And the stewardess noticed this, and she came up to him and, and said, Sir, you know, I, I see you're, you're pretty nervous and stressed. He says, Yeah, I am. And she said, she, she, she was used to this, stewardesses see those who are afraid of flying all the time, and... And so she said, sir, uh, um, would you like a drink from the bar? It might calm your nerves. He said, okay. So she brought him a drink. And he drank it. And he seemed better. But then I, after a little bit, the, the stewardess came back down the aisle again and noticed that this man was stressed and is getting red in the face and, and just shaking, just literally shaking. And so she brought him another drink. And he downed it immediately. He seemed okay. And about 10 minutes later, on her next round up and down the aisle, <coughs> she came to him and saw he was shaking almost as much as he was before. And she leaned down and, and, and said to him, because she didn't want to upset the other, uh, uh, embarrass him and, and upset the other passenger, she said, Sir, you know, if, if you're so afraid of flying, why are you, why are you here? And he says, I'm, I'm not afraid of flying. And she says, Well, well then what's wrong? He said, I'm trying to give up drinking. <laughs> Not only are we afraid of some things, a lot of things, but sometimes we try to alleviate those fears by doing the wrong things. I think it's one of the reasons that people get involved in drugs, amusements of various kinds. I'll talk about that again in just a minute. But there are many things that we're afraid of, and sometimes there are things that we don't even know. We're just af afraid of the unknown. And then also, here's your next blank, sometimes we're afraid of the things we actually do see before us. We're afraid of the things that we do see before us. Situations we might see, for example. Could be physical danger ahead. In some of those cases, fear was, is understandable. But sometimes we fear what we can see and sometimes these things shouldn't bother us. And uh, Jalen, I, I did not put this verse on the, on the handout. I actually added it later, and I didn't give it to you. But in 2 Kings chapter 6, 2 Kings chapter 6, if you could put uh, verses 6, or I mean chapter 6, verses 8 through 12, and then 15 through 17. Jalen's very good at this. I'll get those up for us right away. But what's going on here is that Elisha is, is uh, one of the primary prophets. I'm going to say he is the premier prophet of God in ancient Israel. 
He has taken the place of the prophet Elijah, who had been taken to heaven in a whirlwind not long before, and his, his authority, his office, his spirit had been passed on to Elisha. And Elisha is, is doing his job as the messenger of God. Now, there's an incident going on, an, an episode where, where the king of Syria and the armies of Syria, <coughs> which is an enemy, a natural enemy of Israel, just to the northeast of Israel, he is gathering an army to attack the nation of Israel. And so he got together with his uh, military leaders and they plotted where their camp was going to be, where the armies of, of Syria were going to be. And it was all secret. Nobody knew except the king of Syria and the generals of Syria. But God told Elisha, and Elisha went to the king of Israel and warned him. And he says, don't go anywhere near this area because the armies of Syria are camped in this area with the king of Syria. And they, they were lying in wait for the Israeli army and the king of Israel. They were going to ambush them and kill the king of Israel. <clears throat> but the scripture says... In this way, Israel avoided the, the Syrians and it saved the king of Israel's life not once, not even twice. Several times it saved his life. In fact, let's, let's go there. If, if we've got the verses uh, ready, let's go to verse 8. Okay, then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of, and saved him there not once nor twice. So at least three times. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for these things, and he called his servants and said unto them, Which of you is a spy for Israel? That's my paraphrase. Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? He said, there's a leak going on. Every president, whoever occupies the White House, asks the same question. Who's leaking information to the press? They hate that, right? Well, the king of Syria was upset about this leak. He said, one of you guys is spying for me and giving information to the king of Israel. And they said, no, no, king, we're not. They go down to verse 12, says, One of his servants said, Oh, none, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. In other words, he knows what you're saying even in your bedroom. Somehow he gets the word. In one place in scripture, it's not here, but another place, it says a little birdie told me. That's where that phrase comes from. But God told Elisha what Syria and the king of Syria is plotting to do. And so he warns Elisha, who in turn warns the king of Israel. <clears throat> Let's go down to verse 15. And when the servant of the... Oh, by the way, uh, what I'm skipping here is a couple of verses where the king of Syria says, okay, I'm going to get him for this. I'm going to go and attack this man of God, this Elisha. Let's send an army and just take him out. Okay, he's got too much intel on us. We can't go to battle if he's got all this intel. So verse 15 says, And when the servant of the man of God rose, was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. In other words, the entire Syrian army had surrounded where they were, the, the town where they were. And the servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? What are we going to do? He was terrified when he saw the armies, the troops, the chariots, which in that day were the equivalent of our modern-day tanks, surrounding them all around them. He said, what are we going to do? And he, that is Elisha, answered, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And at that point, the scripture does not say this, but the servant of Elisha looked around, and then looked up at Elisha, and he didn't say it, but he was thinking, are you crazy? There's just you and me. And there's the army of Syria. What do you mean there's more with us than of them? He's probably getting ready to pick up his cell phone, if he had one, call 911 and say, send the guys with the white coats. This guy needs help. But Elisha knew what he was doing. The very next verse, Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. 
Now, was this young man blind? No, not at all. He was just looking with physical eyes. He was looking at what was ahead of him and around him, and that's all he saw. But Elisha saw something else. He said, Lord, open this young man's eyes that he may see. And then uh, it, it, it said, the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. So Elisha and this young man are surrounded by the armies of God with chariots. Not chariots like the Syrians had. These are, he calls them chariots of fire. What he means by that is these are, these are uh, chariots that, that uh, I don't know how to describe it, but let's say they glow. Okay, Spiritual beings and things that are spiritual in nature, <clears throat> on the other side of this physical veil that we have, they don't reflect light like you and I do. The reason I can see you is because the light from the ceiling that shines down on you, reflects into my eyes, is focused on my retina, passed to my brain, amazingly enough, and I can see you because of the reflected light. But spiritual beings, if they were to show up in this room, you would see them not because of that light, but because of the light that they generate from within. Same with these chariots. The reason they're called chariots of fire wasn't that they were flaming chariots. They, they glowed like the, like the spiritual beings that were inhabiting them. You know what I take away from that? It wasn't just Elisha. Elisha was God's representative. Aren't you? Amen. Why should we fear anything? Now, here's another takeaway from it. <coughs> Are you guys keeping up with what's going on in Israel today? A war started yesterday. It escalated overnight. Not only are they being attacked from the Gaza Strip to the southwest, they're now being attacked in the north from Hezbollah in Lebanon. And it's all a proxy war from Iran, two countries over. And the Arab states around them, including Saudi Arabia, are blaming who? Have you noticed this? They're blaming Israel for what happened. Now, Israel is a small country. Anybody been to New Jersey? It's about the size of New Jersey. The entire country is about the size of New Jersey. The distance from the Mediterranean Sea to Jerusalem is 11 miles. 11 miles. That's about the, almost the distance from here to downtown Columbus. That's not that far, okay? We're, we're half a mile south of 161. 161 is 10 miles from downtown. So we're not, it, it, it's not a big country. <coughs> if you lived in Israel today, right now, would you be fearful? Many are. Many are. But God says to Israel, I mean, he's saying it to them today because the same thing is true. God hasn't changed his mind. He told it to them then when they were surrounded by enemies, surrounded by enemies, and they are surrounded by enemies today. The message is don't fear. Why? Because you're my people. Why? Because this is my land. And God's going to protect it. I have every confidence that Israel's going to win this war. Are there going to be casualties? Yes, there are. But folks, <clears throat> let me say this also. Not only are we God's people, Israel is God's people. God called them as a people separate to himself, apart from all the other nations of the world. They are God's chosen people, and God made many promises to them. And it's through Israel that we got the Messiah. It's through Israel we got the scriptures. We need to stand firm with Israel. Amen. We need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, the scripture says. And not just that city, but by extension, the entire country. We need to pray for them. I'm glad to see the leaders of Israel come together and forming a unity government so there's no political factions there. I wish we would do that. Maybe we need a war too. I'm not serious about that. If that's what it takes though. But... God is going to protect them. And we need to stand firm with them. 
Um, anyhow, I just wanted to throw that in here. But fear comes from what we see around us. And God says we shouldn't fear. David, King David, was surrounded by enemies who were uh, his own best friend's dad, King Saul, raised armies to pursue not other countries, but David himself. Chased him all over the country. Chased him out of the country at one point. That's one of the reasons why David wrote in the 23rd Psalm. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. He can say that in the midst of running for his life from someone he should have trusted and someone he refused to take revenge on. And then he later wrote this psalm, in Psalm 34, verse 4, I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Boy, if anybody had reason to fear, it was King David. He was, he was surrounded and pursued and attacked all his life, beginning when he was a teenager, from the king of his own country, to later in his life when his own son rebelled against him and sought his life. Absalom, you remember that story. So he could say, if he could say, he delivered from me from all my fears, we should be able to say that too. When we seek the Lord, look at that verse again. Oh, it's gone. Could you put it back up? He says, I sought the Lord. If we seek him and we know that he hears us, he delivered me. Past tense, he delivered me. David is no longer afraid when he writes this verse. He delivered me from some of my fears. All of my fears. Here's point number two. Fear is not a godly emotion. A godly emotion. I said uh, um, weeks ago when I started this series, I said I'm going to be talking about emotions because God has emotions and he gives us emotions. And the whole point of this whole series is to teach us that the emotions that we have are, are the same as God's. We just tend to use them the wrong way. And we need to learn to channel our emotions in a godly way rather than an ungodly way. Well, this emotion is different from the other ones I've talked about because this is an emotion that God does not have. Is there anything that God's afraid of? Not on your life. No fear at all. And that's why we have this text verse that I began with in 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us the spirit of fear. This is not one of the emotions that we have from God. Instead, he gave us power and love, the spirit of power, the spirit of love, the power of a sound mind. Because fear is up here. It's in the brain. It works on you. It works on you. It works on you. Does it come from the flesh? Does it come from the devil? I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. Scripture didn't tell me. But I know it's not of God. But I know that Satan can use it and work on us and make us afraid of things that we shouldn't be afraid of to keep us from doing the things that God wants us to do, from keep us, to keep us from having the security that God wants us to have. <clears throat> so let's go to point number three. Faith destroys fear. Faith destroys fear. The more we fear or trust God, the less we have to fear from others. Do you know that? The more we trust God, the less we have to fear from others. Boy, that sounds so simple on a Sunday morning at 2 o'clock. You're all checking your watches. No, it's not 2 o'clock. Okay. <clears throat> It sounds so easy in church, doesn't it? The problem is tomorrow morning. The, to the problem is Tuesday afternoon. The problem is Wednesday evening when we have to apply these things. But when we trust God, we don't have to fear others. And when I say others, I'm not just talking about other people. I'm talking about other situations, whatever they are. First John 1, or sorry, I'm sorry, 1 John 4, verse 18 says, There is very little fear in love. Correct me. There is no fear in love. 
There is no fear in love, but perfect. That word means complete. Complete love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected or completed in love. No fear in love. And who is love? John defines it in this chapter. Elsewhere in this chapter, I forget which verse, but he says, God is love. God is love. Psalm 56, verse 4, In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Now, think about what flesh was trying to do to him. It's trying to kill him. Trying to depose him. Trying to take over from him. But he says, I will not fear what flesh can do for me. Why? Because God <laughs> oversaw all of them. He went over their heads. Do you ever have a problem at work and, and you couldn't get a good answer from your supervisor so you went over their head to their boss? Do you ever have to do that? How about with a, with a store? Okay? You didn't like dealing with the clerk. So, so Rose... You didn't like dealing with the clerks. You said, get me the manager. I want to talk to the manager, right? And you changed your name to Karen, right? <laughs> no, I'm just messing with you, Rose. But um, sometimes you have to go over somebody's head to get something done, right? So when people are messing with you, when situations are messing with you, go over their head. Go to the Lord, Right? Amen. There's a passage in Ephesians, <clears throat> not related to this, well, some, somewhat related, but, but uh, Paul is talking to the Ephesian church about the hierarchy that we have. It's talking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Then there's man, there's woman, there's children, and there's servants, right? I don't want to go through all that again, but when he gets to servants, he's talking about servants, serve your master as unto the Lord. As unto the Lord. In other words, when you're working for someone, doesn't matter who you're working for, and we're all working for somebody, right? No matter who you're working for, <clears throat> the right way to look at it is you're not working for the company that you think you're working for. You're not working for the supervisor you think you're working for. You're working for the Lord. And that's the proper way to think about it. When you're working someplace, God is your boss, okay? You're, you're there to honor the Lord, and the Lord is providing your, your pay. You know, he's given you money to meet your bills through that company, through whatever, the, whatever, whatever place you're working for. But he is your boss, not them. You know, that's the only way I've gotten through some of the jobs I've worked in my life. And I've worked, all, I, I think I've counted them up. I think I'm at like 46 or 47 jobs in my lifetime. Obviously, I can't hold a job. But that's a lot of jobs. But, but the only way I've been able to deal with some of the, 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 the stuff that you deal with in work and the people that you deal with in work, the supervisors, the managers that you deal with at work, the foremen you deal with at work. I've had a lot of good bosses, but I've had some real doozies too. The only way I've been able to deal with them was to view them as, as just a minor irritation, and God is my boss. As long as I pleased him, nothing else mattered. And that's what the way to look at life here as well. Don't fear or, or be dismayed by anything else that's going on around you. Paul says we battle not against flesh and blood, right? Don't worry about that. Trust in God. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Here's another source of fear. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, talking about Jesus becoming flesh, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Look at verse 15. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Fear of death holds people in bondage. Now, I, I could develop this and spend a lot of time talking about it. Most people don't want to think about death. Can you blame them? Who wants to think about death? Okay? Okay. People like me who go to cemeteries are weird and very minor, much in the minority, right? 
But most people are afraid of death. And it's one of the reasons, in my belief, that people avoid thinking about mortality and do almost anything in their power to avoid thinking about the inevitability of life and preparing for the end of life. They don't want to think about it. You know what the Greek word for thinking is, or one of the words? Muse, to muse about something. You know what the word for not thinking is? Amuse, amuse. Our world is filled with amusements. Things that are calculated to help people not think. Just not think, just about things in general. I love to get, be in a place where I don't think. I probably shouldn't use this as an illustration, but I'm, I'm going to sometimes Gene, Gene used to say, well, what, what do you got in your mind? What are you thinking about? And I would say nothing. And that was very true most of the time. I think guys are very good at just sitting around and, and, and just, we look like we're there, but we're really zoned out and not thinking about anything at all. And I think women are wired differently. They got like 15,000 things going through their head at the same time. While we guys can sit there and, and our, my brain's in neutral, you know? Nothing's going through my brain. And sometimes I like that. What, my definition of a good movie is a movie that will suck me into the story and I won't think about anything else except the story. That's what movies are for. That's what books are for. That's what plays are for. They're designed to amuse us so we are not thinking. That's what alcohol's for. That's what drugs are for. All these things are designed to help us escape from life so we don't have to think about death. This is why the wisest man who ever lived wrote in the book of Ecclesiastes, it is better to go to the house of mourning than the house of feasting, for there all men will lay it to their heart. What is he talking about? He's talking about the inevitability of death. I'm convinced that the reason why uh, funerals happen and we have funerals, is so that people will be forced to stop what they're doing and go to the house of mourning and think about the fact that eventually they themselves will be guests of honor. They'll be laying in that box right here underneath the pulpit. And everybody will be looking at them and talking about them. This is true of each one of us in this room and myself as well. Every one of us, we need to prepare for the inevitable. Let me interject this question, but we won't give you a chance to respond to it right, right now. Are you ready for that inevitability? Are you ready to face that? It's a very personal thing. It's just you and God. Now, you might be surrounded by a medical team. You might be surrounded by family, but it's just you and God. Amen. Are you ready for that? <clears throat> all of us need to be ready for that, if at all possible. A man, uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, what? Well, yeah, it was a man, I guess it was. A well-known American internist. His name is not given here. But years ago, he said this. In a discussion with the... Um, um, he was at a roundtable discussion on psychosomatic medicine. And he said this. 90% of the chronic patients who see today's physicians, medical physicians, they have one common symptom. 90% of them have one common symptom. Their trouble did not start with a cough or chest pain or hyperacidity. In 90% of the cases, the first symptom was fear. First symptom was fear. <clears throat> he says sometimes the fear is nothing more than a superficial anxiety. Sometimes it's so deep-seated that the patient himself denies its existence and makes the round of doctor to doctor, taking injections, hormones, tranquilizers, and tonics in an endless search for relief. I plead guilty to that. I was that one, uh, one of those one time. <clears throat> I was a hypochondriac in my early third, up until my mid-30s. I used to go to the doctor all the time. I used to, <laughs> well, I'll get to that in just a second. I used to go to the doctor. Sometimes I would have these symptoms. I would have a pain here, have a pain there. I'd have an ache there. I'd have uh, dizziness or something. And, and I, I would come up with this illness that I had. And I would go to my doctor. And he would always give me a clean bill of health. He'd check me over and everything was fine. I've had al almost every kind of illness you can imagine. I mean, I was convinced that I had it. I didn't. But I was convinced that I had it. Well, this one time I went to my doctor, a family doctor, wise old man named Fred Rose. 
He was probably in his, right about 70, this, this time I went to see him. And I came in and he told me, he asked me what was wrong. Uh, and I told him I had a pain right here. And uh, he said, well, sit down and I'll check you. So I sat on the examining table and he looked in my uh, eyes, he looked in my ears, he looked in my mouth, he looked up my nose, you know, he thumped my chest. He listened to my heart, listened to my breathing, front and back. He laid me on the table and he poked and prodded here and there. And then he got up, he said, you can sit up now. And then he got up and very deliberately walked across the examining room, a little bigger than what they are now. Uh, and there was a chair there next to the wall. And he turned around and sat down in the chair with his back against the wall. And he did this. And he looked at me and said, tell me, Paul, what's wrong with you? <clears throat> now, most people would take that as a red flag, okay? Your doctor doesn't sit down, cross his arms, and ask you what's wrong with you after examining but he did. He said, what, tell me what's wrong with you. Well, as thick-headed as I was, I didn't take the hint. So I very quickly said, I have pancreatic cancer. <laughs> no, I don't think I have my medical degree with me. I have no medical training at all. That's brash for a mid, guy in his mid-30s. I was 34 or 35 at the time. And his, his next uh, statement was, he didn't laugh. He should have laughed. And he just looked at me and says, you've got to stop reading Reader's Digest. <clears throat> and he was right. That's where I got him. Because every, every month, Reader's Digest, I don't know if you guys remember this or if you ever read it, but uh, Reader's Digest had 30 articles in their magazine every month. There was one for every day of the month. And every month, there was a disease of the month. <laughs> right? They talked about some disease. And so I, I read, read these things, and every time I would read about a disease, I would start to get the symptoms. I know it's funny. It is. It's funny to me now, but it wasn't at the time. It was very serious. <clears throat> so he, he stopped, and he, and, he, and he gave me a lecture. He actually lectured me for 15, 20 minutes, a, a, a father-son kind of a lecture. And he says, you know, you're very young. You're very healthy. You're probably going to live a long time. He says, just learn to live life one day at a time and enjoy it. He said, eventually you're going to die of something, but you're not even close to that now. I'm paraphrasing this and boiling down this, this uh, thing he gave me. But, but from that day on, I didn't worry about anything anymore. That was really good advice. And I learned not to worry about stuff. Because he was right, and I stopped reading the disease of the month. <clears throat> but this... this article hit me because he said 90% of all chronic patients who go to see doctors, they begin with fear. And that was the case with me. And I see, I don't think that's true of everybody, but I, it was true with me. And it's true of a lot of pa people today as well. They go to the doctor because they're fearful of something and they want assurance from the doctor that they're okay. We have to be careful of that. Now, medical science is, is great. And, and I, I like medical science. I like doctors and nurses. I think they're wise. I think I, they do a wonderful thing. But we shouldn't put our trust in doctors and nurses. God is the one we should put our trust in. Remember King Azariah in the Old Testament. He got very uh, sick. And, and uh, the scripture says that he put his trust in the doctors instead of in the Lord. And that's one of the reasons the Lord took his life. We, because he didn't trust the Lord. He trusted in the doctors. And the Lord said, hey, I'm going to show you who's boss here. And he took him out. But that's why David could say in Psalm 23, verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they, what? Comfort me. And in Matthew 10, 28, the Lord tells us who we should fear. He says, you're afraid of death? You're afraid of the things you can't see? You're afraid of the things you can see? I'll tell you what to be afraid of. He says, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Folks, the Lord is always there with us. Just as I prayed today a couple of times, the Lord's always there with us. No matter what we go through, he's always there with us. We can trust him. We never go through anything alone. There's a lesson there for us to learn. You know, many, many years ago, some Native American tribes used to train their young boys to be warriors. <clears throat> when they were around the age of 13, they would, they would finish their training. They'd already been taught how to fish. They'd already been taught how to hunt. They'd already taught how to scout, you know, how to read signs and, and 
footprints of animals and people and stuff like that. They'd already been trained to all that kind of stuff, but there was one last test for them to take. What they would do is they'd take a young boy about the age 13 who'd gone through all the other training. They would blindfold him after dark. They would take him out in the middle of a thick woods. And they would lead him to a place and ask him to stand there. And then wait a certain period of time till everybody left and then take off his blindfold. And so he would do that. When everybody had left and all was quiet, he would take off his blindfold, look around. He was all alone in the middle of a very, very dark, thick forest. And most boys would be terrified all by themselves. They've never been there before. They don't know where they are. They're not sure which way they came in. They don't know how to get back out because there were no trails. Every time a stick broke, they were fearful. What animal is that? They would hear the sounds in the forest and be afraid of what was there. And they would spend the entire night there all alone, trying to sleep but probably not able to, always fearful of what was going to get them. And then as the day began, and it began to get lighter, the boy would begin to look around and inspect his surroundings. And eventually he would notice, not too far off behind a tree over there, there was a man with a bow and arrow. It was his dad watching over him all night long. And it taught him he was never alone as a warrior that they were bonded together. I think it's a lesson for us too. Sometimes when we think we're all alone, we're in a dangerous situation all by ourselves, maybe dark, maybe dangerous, but God is there. He's just watching over us all the time. He never slumbers, he never sleeps. Psalm 121. Who are we trusting in? And what are we afraid of? One last story and I'm done. In Boca Raton, Florida, not too long ago, Jerry Stevens was a pilot, a sky riding pilot. You ever seen sky riding? Anybody? Okay. I've only, I think I've only seen it once or twice. But Jerry Stevens is a sky riding pilot based in Boca Raton, Florida, and he decided to greet the new year by writing, God is great, and similar messages in the sky above the city of Boca Raton. When the people of the city saw the sky writing, they panicked and called police. They thought it was a terrorist plot. Because you know the terrorists like to say, God is great. Allahu Akbar in Arabic. But it tells a lot about a country. We have no fear of God, it seems, but we are terrified of the terrorists. But God tells us who to be afraid of and who not to be afraid of. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, the wisest man who ever lived said this, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I don't know what the Lord has for you in this message. But it, there are a lot of things in this world that can make us fearful. In fact, Scripture teaches that in the end days, men's hearts will fail them from fear. Let's not be one of them. Let's put our trust in God. Amen? And if you're not saved, that's especially true of you. If you're not saved, boy, you have a lot to fear. Real fears. But if you trust in God, if you come to Him and put your trust in Him, all that goes away. Father, may your will be done. In this invitation, may our responses in the next few minutes honor and glorify you. For we ask it all in Jesus' name, for his sake, with thanksgiving. Amen. You come as we sing. We have counselors down here. They'll be glad to pray with you if you want them to. You don't have to let them do that, but they're there for you.